For a video companion to this podcast, as well as information regarding materials and equipment, log on to our YouTube. Welcome to Making Muppetland the Podcast. And I have with me Brent, who uh, we worked hand in hand together. Brent did all of the design and construction on Muppetland. And uh, another good friend of mine, Nick, is here joining me on this podcast. And Nick plugs in here. Um, Nick and I grew up together uh, back in Pennsylvania. and But Nick plugs in here because what a lot of people don't know is I was running an arcade before COVID, and we'll talk about this later. Uh, and we had developed a lot of things that never actually came to fruition because we were supposed to build a location that was supposed to open last summer. And, uh, and that's really where Muppet Land, Brent, was kind of birthed, was out of the ashes of this COVID pandemic. But I, I, I want to back up. But, so welcome. So welcome to the Muppet Land, the, uh, the Making Muppet Land podcast. And, and what you'll see or hear uh, over the next five episodes, and we'll try to keep it to about 45 minutes an episode, is not only how did we build this thing, but kind of what we learned. Because... This entire story begins with failure. I mean, it really, the idea of having a business that gets knocked out by COVID-19, as a lot of people have experienced, uh, and then sort of out of the ashes of it, a viral video, and and then you just learn as you, you go kind of thing. For that to have all happened, which is essentially the short form version of how we got here, Um I think it's inspiring for people. And Brent, we put up the other day the final ride through video. I think we started working on making Muppet Land. What we started working on making a ride before we even knew what ride we were making. What back in August? Hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, we 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 talked about it even before then originally, uh, but it was just a dream concept originally. We we really didn't plan on doing it full full depth at scale was we had other plans for what you we were going to be doing with your, you know, with your business. And yeah, COVID basically set us on a completely different direction. And we sat there and said, you know, we've got this X amount of material sitting there that we can work with that we don't have to spend a lot of money on uh, just to test the grounds of, of everything from animatronics to, um, to uh, testing a, a vehicle that would actually move on its own pacing uh, to just creating a visual design of what we were going to do from getting from A to B on this little ride idea. And it's funny you mentioned animatronics because for everything we did in Muppet Land, we're using servo motors and how we even thought of those is a whole nother story too, which that's why you're listening but growing up, I used to watch Nick tinker with RC cars in his basement, and he was using the same type of technology back then. This is before I ever knew how to even work on arcade games. So growing up in Pennsylvania, Nick would tinker with that kind of stuff. I was always trying to make a movie in, in the garage or something, and we'd tinker. And summers, I would go to a, a camp called French Woods Festival where I met you, Brent, where you were doing yeah. production design for, for their theater and and I'll let you run with this for a second, but French Woods is, is a very notable theatrical camp. Uh, Nick, Upstate Nick New used, York. Yeah. yeah, Nick used to laugh at me because I would go away to this did. theater camp for nine oh. weeks and kind of disappear. But it was like a wonderland because, you know, you were, Brent, 20 some odd years old and I was like a teenager. I was like 13. Yeah, you, yeah I think you were 12 when I first met you. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I was early twenties at the time teaching there, uh, bought in from overseas from Australia. And, uh, and, um, I think we first, you know, I, I still can't remember how we first met, but I remember that our both interest and love of star Wars and Muppets was yeah. the first real, uh, reminded introduction of how we, and what we got along so well with and talked about and, and uh, and then uh, as a couple of years passed, you kept on coming back and being a thorn in the side. And it was like, <laughs> okay, well, he's here. He needs to learn how to do some of this stuff. So in, in my infinite wisdom, tried to teach you some uh, bits and pieces. And uh, And it's interesting, you know, there are some kids that 
listen and learn and walk away and go, eh, whatever. And there are other kids who are just like, I need to know more. I need to know more. And you're one of those kids that needed to know more and understand if you didn't, un- you know, if you didn't understand something, you would ask the questions. I don't understand. Uh, show me more. Make me. I probably said that a more. lot. You said that a lot. You know, I never get annoyed with anybody who keeps on asking questions. I, 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 it's the only way you're going to learn something from somebody else is to actually ask questions. It's the people who don't ask questions that go ahead and try to do something and, and, and keep saying, you know what, I don't need to ask questions. And it's like, you know what, no, you do need to ask questions. You need to learn. You need to understand from experienced people. Uh, so never be afraid to ask questions uh, when you're, when you're uh, uh, doing anything in the form of arts, there's always something you can learn. There's always stuff that I still learn and I'm always yeah. still asking questions. You never stop learning. Well, that's just it. That's what I was going to say because, and you, and you remind me of two other things, but when you, when you bring up <laughs> camp, I, I, I actually hadn't even thought about them, but the entire exercise of building Muppet land was an exercise and not knowing it was a pure yeah. educational experience. We went into it knowing we were in over our heads and down to the, filming the video i mean we you know what a lot of people probably are like well you went silent on tiktok for two weeks if you're here you probably know this all started with the five steps video on tiktok how to build a disney ride and that started with you and me tinkering irrespective of a ride brent we were trying to just learn stuff like oh let's do like a a whiteboard castle and do some projection mapping and use after yeah. effects versus some off the shelf projection software. So there's always tinkering. And then I would talk to Nick separately and be like, Hey, how do you do this? You know? And, <laughs> and um, but, but real quick. So, and, and then Nick, I want to bring you back in here. I Brent, I remember just because you brought it up then about, first of all, you put me off onto all these puppet related projects which kind of brings the whole thing full <laughs> circle i now look right. back yeah you were always putting me on some side project involved puppets pulleys yes. or some sort of specialty yes. and it was yeah. always like eh, it doesn't really matter if he screws up because we don't know who's going to make this anyway at least he'll get us a little bit closer at least that's yeah. how it always felt yeah yeah um but that's truly what building a dark ride turned into for us yeah. Um, oh, yeah. and you know, the other thing I want to say really quick, which is just funny to me, is, yeah, we grew up with a love of Star Wars. Um, we bonded on the Muppets and a whole host of other things. And obviously, Disney was listening because they bought them all. And, you know, growing up, those were not Disney properties. Yeah, you yeah. know, DuckTales might have been. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but Henson wasn't. Certainly Star Wars wasn't. I mean, that's all new. Yeah. And it's just it's funny how our entire to bring all that back in it's like we built this ride which is sort of based on muppet land which was a marketing concept that disneyland never did under the eisner years they were actually going to when they bought the muppets they were going to do a disneyland takeover they i think they were going to paint the matterhorn green it was going to be a full-on muppet takeover right that marketing promotion never happened that was ultimately the concept for the ride that we built but our love of all these things that are ultimately now Disney, it's just funny how it all coalesces because back yeah, then yeah. Star Wars was just Star Wars. The idea of anything close, let alone the Mandalorian, the idea of a trilogy follow up yeah, yeah. was unheard of. So, yeah. um, but Nick, so you and I, you know, would, would I would watch you tinker and, and by the time I get to being out here in LA and having an arcade business, you're you're off to the races doing concert lighting and stuff that I didn't even know what like DMX meant back then. I thought it was just the rapper. Yeah, um, I, I still don't know what it means, but I know how to use it. That's, that's the important part. But 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 no pun intended. I was going to say shed some light without even catching myself. But what what yeah. is that experience like? Because I know now, and Brent has seen it going through programming. Like that is not an easy thing to take on and to even know where to start. I don't even know how you get into that. No, uh, it's, man, how to get into it. It's, you start from the basics. We used to have a light show that we called it like the Home Depot light show where we had a thing called a light organ where it would react to sound. And there was eight different outlets you would plug things into and the lights would do different stuff. And I'm like, okay, this is cool, but I can't control it. And you know me, I need to be in control. So I started looking on the computer and I fell into this rabbit hole and I found DMX. And I was like, 
huh, and it, I didn't, and it wasn't the rapper. So, right. um, yeah, the more and more I learned about it, then I just said I had to get this stuff, uh, and I started off with some basic cheapo dmx lighting some i found a software that was uh it wasn't free but it had a demo uh that you could try it so i did that and it started to grow and grow and grow and then i understood it more and more and more and i just i fell in love with it it's really cool and great to be able to have an idea uh take some not just have an idea in your head but take something else that's external uh and not lighting like like you're saying with the concert music, you take that, you put this, you, you put the two together and to then sit down at a computer and, and type away and hack away and, and connect all these things with wires. And the next thing you know, you have a fully automated light show that's in sync and controlled by you. Um, you know, it's like you're the, you know, they, they, the extra person performing in the band. It's just, you're not on stage. You're, you're, instruments are on stage but you yourself are physically backstage front of house somewhere running all of it um and yeah we would talk about how to possibly incorporate some stuff where you would say hey i want to do this and i'm like i think there's a way to do that and uh that's kind of how it all started you know or at least how the integration of lighting and dmx into the arcade started where you'd come up with an idea is this possible and anything's possible. You just have to figure out how to do it. And that's all three of us are great at that. It's just like, we have an idea and let's make this happen. Just a matter of how and figuring it out, trial and error, like you said, failure. And it's, you fail, fail, fail. And it finally works. And you have that aha moment. And uh, I think it's safe to say we've all had that a lot of times, that aha moment. Well, and you know what? And that's such a perfect um, segue to where I want to go next, because growing up as a Disney park geek, which is how I can continue to identify myself because of all the acquisitions of all other things that I love. I can just now just relegate myself to Disney park nerd because they own it all. Um, but growing up, I always used to look at that stuff and go, how do you do it? I always wanted, you know? And so by the time I got to owning an arcade and I knew what you were up to with lighting, Nick, and then I would say, well, like, what if I, so growing up, we grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia and uh, there was a movie called Mannequin. Mannequin was filmed in the Philadelphia, was it the Wanamakers in Philadelphia? Yeah. yeah. But there was this light curtain. And I, I, I will get, I will find this footage. I know it's on YouTube because I've looked it up in the past and I'll, I'll, it will share it with you. But it, this, so my parents would take me down to the Christmas light show at Wa and it was almost what you just described with your Home Depot light show because back then it would have been tantamount to Christmas lights you know, put into some sort of like very like um, rudimentary dimmer pack, you mm -hmm. know, something like theater lighting. We would do like stage lighting, Brett, at camp where mm -hmm. it's like we used to have stage lighting. You couldn't program it, but you'd have this big dimmer pack and you would have all these different channels of, of lighting. They'd be like stage pin and you could you could have a board and you could do sequencing with the board, this dimmer up, that dimmer down. But you couldn't do the kind of stuff that you were doing nick so i yeah. always wanted to capture the wanamaker's light show and i would say to nick i want to do and he's like well this is you, you can't really do that because you want to do a show and this is like you know like you need to put an input into it and i didn't understand that oh if i'm not giving it like a sequence like it's not timeline based yeah i think what it, like what you're saying too though one of the most interesting or fun parts about this royce was like us literally being on either coast your west coast on east coast and how many times would i or would we be talking and then i grab a piece of paper and i sketch out a quick idea of how this works you know hold it up to the camera send you that text you're like Oh, now I get it. Or you at least have a better understanding. But it's right. exactly that where it's like, it was hard. Not, it, you know, we had to figure out how to communicate this and how to make it work literally on opposite ends of the country. And we did. I mean, and then I would come out there and make it literally make it work. But, uh, and then we just kept adding to it. Yeah. Like every, every July. And I remember like Brent, we built the tunnel and Brent, mm -hmm. Brent built, like, I'm telling you, it looked like he was building mm -hmm. Jabba the Hutt. He built like this pipe rib cage that like he like pulled up into the ceiling and then we lined it in LEDs. And yeah, I mean, it was like, we were on a, we're always on a budget, but nobody can ever tell. We always look like we're not, but it was like this led light tunnel. Like we got to the point, then you're doing, 
uh, pixel based control. And so long story short, I, I wind this is before COVID. I wind up with this great opportunity to open up a new arcade location in the mall. And we had gotten to the point of doing all this fun stuff with lighting. Uh, I think uh, Nick, you had made, you were making handmade China balls with LEDs and stuff in them and just all this really cool lighting based stuff. So the idea of adding animatronics while it didn't seem realistic to me at the time, it didn't seem out of scope. And um, so what happens is Brent and I went, Nick, Nick, you were back East. Brent and I are starting to design this new arcade, this new arcade that never happens. It never opens. But Brent and I went to Garner Holt. Is it Garner? I always, you've confused me so many times over the last two years. Is it? It's Garner <laughs> Holt. Garner Holt. Yes. Yeah. But you always add it. I separated. <laughs> I always separated the. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dyslexic but we went. Game. Yeah, yeah, it's okay, and you, it's it's cool. But it, we went, and it, so for anyone, Garner Holt does like all the uh, um, secondary. I don't want to say secondary, but they do all the outsourced animatronics for for Disney and all the Disney parks, as well as now stuff for Universal. So we're walking around this warehouse, and we're seeing like the old animatronic that. Um, was from like the the great movie ride at MGM Studios, and it's like it's like the uh, the the chimney sweep from Mary Poppins, and and we're seeing like literally ride vehicles from Disneyland, right? Like Space Mountain ride vehicles. We're seeing full on animatronics. I mean, it was like, and then they sit us down into like this little mini show. Do you remember that, Brent? Yes. Yeah. 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 The Abraham Lincoln show. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know how you felt walking out of that, but I saw everything they were doing, and maybe it was just ego. I go, between me, Nick, and Brent, we could do everything they're doing in this warehouse. And I love what they do. It wasn't a knock at them. It's just it's always comes back to budget. That's sort of the production background in all of us. Um, And I do want to kind of deviate to that for a second, Brent, because your production background, I mean, we met at French Woods, and a lot of notable people, and I'll let you run with this too, went to French Woods, but – Talk about some of the stuff you've worked on, because when people look at what we're doing and, yeah, we're on a budget. But the reason it looks so good is because you have this incredible Jedi skill set that allows you just to take like paint and tape. It's like MacGyver. And then the next thing you know, we have a dark ride. I was lucky at the summer camp. There was was a lot of pressure on getting a lot of shows done. Uh, there was five different theaters. There was uh, there was uh, two scene shops. I was in charge of the larger one, and as every year I went back, they added more and more theater productions. So you had to find ways to become faster and still produce a quality of work that looked good, that you know the kids were happy with, that they could perform on stage with. And these weren't just little dinky shows; they were full full on theater productions for all different ages of kids between the age of seven and 17. Um, So yeah, uh, on top of it, you also had to teach your staff because you didn't always necessarily get a full uh, equivalent staff in the first place. And then on top of it, you had all the kids coming in from day to day wanting to learn and paint and do a little bit of set construction and all that sort of stuff. So speed became my main thing of moving at a fast pace and thinking on a different level of how to create these theater productions. Uh, and that was during the summertime. During the, the winter times, I did some work at some uh, high schools out in, back in Los Angeles. Um, I uh, did a lot of freelancing on some low budget film and, and commercials and uh, music videos. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, just, you know, worked my way around and, uh, found different fun projects. Surprisingly, a lot of the really, really fun projects are the ones that are really low pay, but I've done some really fun ones. It's nice to get occasional big pay gigs as well. Uh, I did do uh, a production design, a music video for the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 for a music video called Guardians Inferno, uh, directed by David Yavesky. And uh, that was a lot of fun. It was a very 70s flair and theme to it. Uh, so everything everything that I do in production design and set design, there's always something different, always something fun, and always something is a new challenge. And the idea is to take every project as a new challenge. So when it came to the actual ride, A, 
I've never done a ride before, a ride process, although I could create the visuals of what you would you'd look like. There's still an element of learning and self-teaching uh, to a certain degree. I knew nothing about um, um, about um, uh, 3D um, printing until basically when COVID came around, more or less, that's when I really started to self-teach. I had the time to see self-teach myself how to 3D print things and how to actually figure out through SketchUp how to actually make this stuff work, how to alter sizes. Um, and uh, um, it's a different experience than someone teaching you. Um, self-learning, you get to explore on your own and 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 but let me let me jump in on that for, for a second yeah. because the 3d printing thing is a fascinating track in this whole thing uh and it brings us back to the thing that we designed which is this arcade esports location that was going to open up in the mm -hmm. westfield topanga mall yep and we were going to have some 3d printers in there and we were going to let kids print these these robots that um they weren't they were they were going to have articulation yeah in other words, basically what I'm trying to say is we had gone enough down the rabbit hole to use Nick's term that we were able to like, or I should say you uh, were able to, I figured out how to use the 3D printer and then was like, Brent, look. And then Brent figured out like, oh, what file do you need? I can use SketchUp. So we had these, these robots, which would have been cool. And we could have yeah. opened this business and they would have been cool, but they weren't animatronics. Yeah. And then COVID hits and that's where you suddenly have all this time and wh where you were a year ago from where you are today and what you've learned. I can't even imagine. You tell me all the time, like the amount of files and the modifications that you've gone through. You know, that's the thing. I mean, uh, every time you create something new, you need to print it out, test it, see if it fits with the other piece properly. And sometimes you have to go back and change little things and it doesn't, always you know work straight away uh patience is a great big part of this entire process um because you have your bag of parts i love it there there are several failures along the way to get to the progressive part yeah uh, and we've we've all learned that in in experience whether it's the ride or whether it's your original arcade or anything else again in life uh, so that process of learning and failing is a huge part about how you learn to succeed. In the end, you just don't give up. You keep on trying and eventually you find the right thing. So, yeah, when it goes to the 3D printing and the design elements, uh, lots of trial and error. Still to this day, we've got trial and error. And there are things that I've said to you even today. I'm going, I can change this. I can make this better. Yeah. I now know how to that I didn't know maybe a week ago or a month ago. So we sit down and you forever change things till you feel you've got it just right. And there are things we've got just right. There are things that we want to change and want to keep working with. And, and that's a big part of it. Yeah. And then once you've got it just right, you change it again because then you're like, well, yeah, oh, you now I see it through a whole nother lens, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. I mean, right, Nick, yeah. you can speak to that. When you, when you came out here and we designed even the first LED curtain, right? Like I didn't understand it all. So I'd be like, I want to do this. I want to do that. And Nick would be like, this is how this works. And this is how that works. And that first curtain, that first time after it was all done, I would go in there and I would just play music and put it on sound reactive. So there's no data going into it, no programmatic. It's just taking the, and I would go nuts just playing songs, right? Somewhere along the line, that wasn't enough though. Somewhere along the line, once I got it right, once, you know, you were done doing your part, Brent, you were done doing your part. It's like, okay, cool. We can control lights. But what if we could control motors, you know, and when we had that experience going to Garner Holt yep. and you realize now everybody's moving towards electric, they're not actually doing new, um, pneumatic and, and hydraulic stuff as much when it comes to animatronics. It, you realize it's more accessible and, and God bless Amazon because Amazon <laughs> makes everything accessible, especially in a pandemic world. But this place that we were going to build wasn't it was going to be very interactive so the point that i'm getting to is that we had already acquired some of this hardware 
and it would have done DMX lighting control. And I was learning how to do some basic servo control because Brent, we were going to do some stuff like conveyor belt monorail thing with like robots hanging again, not mm-hmm. robots moving yet, but yeah. we were getting close. Yeah. So by the time COVID hits, we've got a warehouse, the ashes of a, of a business, uh, a, a box, an empty box. We could do nothing with at the mall. No federal government relief, nothing. It just, just sitting basically like people go, Oh yeah, I just have 10 TVs lying around. Well, we did because they were supposed to go into this mall location for a different use. So now we're sitting on this, um, this control hardware. We're sitting on Showforge software and, um, Vagel to say it correctly, hardware. And that's the kind of stuff that places like Garner Holt use, um, to control motors lighting and other aspects of theme parks i don't know if anyone's ever done a ride with it before i didn't question it i just remember saying to you at some point that we could build a ride and calling or texting nick and being like if i get this 12 volt motor what do i do you know and um but i don't remember how we got from that like where did we actually put a track down do you remember, Brent? Because before it was Muppet Land, I know it was just, can we make a vehicle move on a track? Yeah, uh, that, that was, well, there, was, there was a couple of things we were thinking about, I think, for the original concept of the more For ideas, we were throwing out ideas on the floor saying, let's throw everything on the floor. Let's, let's see what will work for that particular time in that particular space. And one of them was your fascination with with movement and you <laughs> no you you, you do you you, yeah. you 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 always said if you if you won a million dollars tomorrow you would have a train going through your house and outside and out the back and around the yeah. pool if, if you had if, if you won that you that's one of the first things you do and then i you know we kind of sat down it was like well what if we try to do that with not a million dollars but what's the technology out there uh, I can build the framework easy enough for something as as a as a as easy as a train. You need to go look and see what's out there. And 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 then I said, I have no idea anything about mechanical stuff. That's all you, buddy. I have no clue. And you went out and you found a wheelchair frame. <laughs> well, wait a second, because you know what I'm thinking of before you even go there is when yeah, we yeah. were designing the locate the original arcade that never got mm. built. Yes. You started designing 3D parts for like a mini train for like a monorail train thing that yeah, was going yeah. to be a conveyor system. Much yes, if you've yeah. been, if anyone's been to the droid factory at Disney, at Disneyland or Disney World, we wanted to have like hanging parts going around like a track above you. That's called a monorail. The monorail that you ride is called a monorail train, just to make mm-hmm. the distinction before somebody puts the comment down there. But you so you were already doing the moving ride but on top of whatever size that work table is one of those wooden work tables those benches that you built yeah and it was it was a track that you built out of what foam core uh originally it was foam core just to get an idea of size uh and and uh perspective but uh at that point, it was a matter of just once we found out what worked in the sense of the vehicle that we were trying to do as a miniature, that it would fit and move upon it. Uh, I think there was some back and forth between you and Nick at that point as to as to how the track would work and how this thing would roll on the track, if I remember rightly. Well, yeah, because we had looked at stock systems, right, Nick? Mm-hmm. We were talking about all like uh, different rail systems. Yeah, we must have like found any and anything that would move on a track or rail from like garage door tracks to model trains to slot cars to even like Legos and and toy building blocks trying to almost like reverse engineer something that would possibly work. Uh, We would just go back and forth. And you look at the the professional stuff, like you go to a dry clean. Basically, like we were trying to build what you see in a dry cleaner, where you see your suits go flying by in the background, and eventually they get that. But that was clearly out of the budget. So what do you do when it's out of budget? Make your own. At least that's what we all do. We don't go out and we can make this. But I mean, isn't that the Disney Imagineering concept and principle? 
is that oh, yeah. I mean, what they always started to do. I mean, and I love that Disney Plus documentary series. I really do. I wish they do more of them, mm. um, like one for each ride. But I it's just the idea that if you don't know how to do it, it doesn't stop you. And that goes back to what you were saying, Brent, about learning and never stop learning. Mm, and that's yeah. what's so exciting. It's not people comment when we start putting up these videos and there was never an intent to share what we were doing. I put up the first video on a whim and then it's like, oh, OK, well, we'll share. But we always knew we were going to fail. With any of the things I'm talking about, whether Nick, it was building that first light curtain or whether it's building Muppet land, like nobody ever said, let's not do it. Cause we might not be able to pull it off. That's just the mentality. Right. So yeah. that never stops you. I think that's really, if anybody if takes anything away from what we're doing here and talking about is that you never stop learning and fear of failure is, is really arbitrary because you have to fail yeah. to succeed. And it's not a cliche. You were building the ride before we knew we were building the ride we were using little continuous micro servos a little like six volt battery pack and it would run on its own around a little foam core track and the wheels the wheels weren't like guided they were just it was just limited to the space it had to wiggle around but Royce, also even before we got to moto servers and all this sort of stuff you were talking about um uh um uh lego uh pieces that you can actually get where you got little mechanisms and things like that and uh what's the the other uh metal set um oh like erector the, set stuff erector sets yes sorry yeah uh and and erector sets and you're saying well let's let's build this out of an erector set kind of thing and sometimes you go back to the basic stuff that's already out there just to learn how that can work and see how that can work and how can you improve on it f and make it work for what you need to do um so it does take a little bit of, again, as I said, patience and learning uh, bit by bit. You learn from different sources and you you build up on that. And the Internet these days also is an amazing source of we don't understand it. You learn it. You don't always find exactly what you're looking for for what you want to do, but it sets you on a path to do what you want to do because your imagination is part of the part of the, the joy ride of that. No pun intended. And that was the exercise, though, because we, for all intent and purpose, we didn't have a business. So we didn't have the um, the deadline anymore of we have to get this done. Mm -hmm. Now we had the ability to take what we thought was sort of a finished concept and go, well, what if we took it a little bit further? Now, like they take these 3D printed robots. What if they were animatronic? What would that look like? And, you know, and then it's failing, right? It's you print them out, which takes hours, let alone designing them. You yeah. print them out, you wire up the motors. And then, you know, because, you know, you're doing all this different stuff, you find out somewhere along the line, oh, you know what? Oops, that's the wrong this or that doesn't even fit. So now I got to go. And and I think we were watching you were watching a video the other day, like an Adam Savage video. And you were telling me mm -hmm. how like it's like he had to stop because it's like, oh, I got to go over this adapter now like that kind of stuff is always going to happen yeah um did i i've always wanted to build a ride did i ever think i'd do it i don't think so i don't think i ever actually truly thought i'd do it i think what's so exciting about having done it is the learning experience truly because now imagine what the next ride's going to be and you know we're, we're we've got about 10 minutes left here in this episode but i what i'm hoping to bring this to as we as we go and tee up the next episode is you know once we started to literally lay the track down then it really did go back to story right it came back to theme and and you and i love star wars and so funny enough that was the first thing we took off the table yeah like we're not going to do it, star it, wars know, it, it it did you know it it wasn't just that but it was like it just didn't cross my mind to even try to do anything star wars related there's so much out there right now uh i i mean i think you 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 were the one who kept on pushing on the Muppets, and I was like, you know, the funny thing is that we both love the Muppets, but they're not necessarily the the in thing as much right now. I mean, there's new shows being made and stuff like that, but but we we have a vision from our childhood of what we remember of the Muppets from the Muppet Show and and how that worked, and we just wanted to give it a try and and actually take a little bit of understanding of what they did 
and how they did it and have fun with it. And there's nothing more than just having fun with it. Uh, we, we've got our own product that we are going to be pulling together in the future. Um, but the Muppet stuff is the best way for us to express ourselves at this point in time just because we are so familiar with it from our childhood. Well, and it was also inspirational um, internally because here, here, literally, I mean, you gotta, I mean, we're all going through this together with, with, with the pandemic, but you have no income, you have no future for all intent and purpose. We don't know what's next. And the idea of, I want to teach myself something new. That's a challenge unto itself. Nick, you can speak to this. It's like, oh, I'm going to like, we were talking about this separately uh, in a private conversation, but it's like, you know, I want to spread everything out on the kitchen table and leave it there for a couple of days. Like, I don't want to disrupt it because until I'm done, I'm not done. And when you get into that mode, you know, it's fantastic, but sometimes you kind of need a kick in the butt. So for me, the idea of the Muppets was it gave us a sandbox to play in that was inspiring. It was hard to get to work every day when there was nothing going on and it crawled for me personally. It got me, it crawled me back in. And then when I saw these motors moving and then Brent, you take this 3d printed thing you do, and then you add the bird, the very first birds, which, you know, you, you they, they were thrown together them. in a day. So, so they, they were, and they looked they incredible just, at the moment, whatever we had lying around material wise. And that's the thing we've, we've been using a lot of whatever we've got lying around right now. We can't afford to spend the money. We were able to work with bits of felt and bits of fabric and creating the birds and, and, and picked up a few small screws and bits and pieces to what we, what we really needed to go get. But yeah. And that's like Royce. We always say when we talk, uh, I know Brent, I, you're not on those conversations because yeah. Royce and I are talking, but yeah, we yeah. always talk about like, you know, the proof of concept where you're taking stuff and it, again, it stinks to be on the East coast, but it is what it is. But uh, you're taking whatever you have and you're making this amazing and awesome proof of concept. And every time Royce sends me a video, it's like, it's literally like a timeline. I mean, it is a timeline of like, yeah the progress and and every time i get one i'm like oh god i need to be on the west like oh soon soon, soon. he keeps it when are you coming out soon soon i've been you know? i've been telling him when are you coming out here oh, <laughs> yeah. no, wait, wait, wait. it's gonna be soon i hope now you're gonna have a whole bunch of other people saying when is nick getting out there imagine yeah. what they could do if they're on the same room oh, well that's i mean i i think that's another kind of an amazing thing just to add is just like the stuff we're able to do both being apart, you know, like yeah. e even when, you know, I would leave after putting up the curtain or doing the tunnel or making the laser and this and that all work. And it's like, you text me or call me, Hey, this isn't working. And between what I have here and you have there, we get it working. Or I'd send you a new file of the entire show and try this one and it works, you know? So, uh, yeah, it's just it's yes. Once once we are all and we have been in the same room together, it's amazing and it's really awesome to watch and work together and to see everything just happen. And but I will say happens. it's 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 exciting. Like you know, you talk about the pencil sketches. It's like it it kind of from my vantage point, it, it especially in this process of building Muppet Land, which is only our first ride, which is kind of a cool thing to even say. Wink, wink. <laughs> is, 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 you know, those that really know, know. We've put it out there before. They know about the mall, but we'll, we'll, we'll give you more information. You're going to be able to ride some version of one of our rides next summer. Uh, it may not be Muppet Land unless you all knock on Disney's door hard enough. But what I was going to say is we, you, you know, we co collectively are able to push the limits in a way that I think are really, really fun. And maybe you're sometimes reinventing the wheel and, and, and it's good, but I think what's exciting for me is when you do get those pencil sketches and Nick will like do like a really down and dirty pencil sketch. And then I can like show it to Brent. And then suddenly that pencil sketch somehow turns into like a 3d mock-up. And then within days, that 3d mock-up is this wooden thing. And then another day later, that wooden thing is painted and then it's whatever it may be. I'm not even talking in, in specifics, it's just that sort of ping-ponging nature of, well, what if you tried it this way? How's that going to work? Oh, I'll try it. Like, okay, well, I don't know. I'll let you know. And it might not work. Oh, go back to the drawing board. And those pencil sketches are everything because it's everything. I, mean, I, I wrote this down the other day. Everything you know started 
in someone's mind as an idea. And, you know, whether it's Disneyland or your favorite movie, the Muppets, I mean, it all starts with like a little one little spark. Right. Um, And I just think it's really cool to jump into the deep end sometimes not knowing you know how deep the water is and in this case it was building this amusement ride and you come out the other end and you've learned so much and now you look at it quite frankly and you're like i could do better you know what i mean like it's only been done in 24 hours brent and i'm like "Eh, yeah i mean if if, and done is a very loose term yeah yeah but that's every creative person's attitude i can do better this isn't my best Uh, and I know when I do or when I cue a light show or and I build this or that, I always find the flaws and no one sees it, but I see them and I know they're there and I want to, that's what really, you know, pushes, I think anyone that's creative and artistic to do better, you know, cause yeah, you want well, to go let, beyond what you're capable of and, and keep on doing that and doing that and doing that and doing that and doing that. Well, let's use that as a springboard for the, for, for, for the next episode as we get we start to wrap this up because, Brent, bringing that back to the animatronics and the 3D mm. printing, yeah. I mean, you, you've said this to me numerous times. There was a point where you couldn't get down to, like, a precise measurement. And for whatever yeah. reason, you couldn't figure out just – basically, it's, it's the equivalent of I couldn't figure out how to use this part of the software. And because of that, it sets you off on a prohibitive nature. Once you unlocked yeah. that and learned that new little – yeah, yeah thing you're just then the the whole world changes right exactly yeah 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 then you go back and you start from scratch because sometimes it's easy to rebuild something from the beginning uh with the new knowledge that you've got uh sometimes you can just add straight to it too Mm. yeah but what do you think is the when you know when we look at what we've done so far and i i might even know where what you're going to say here but what do you think in terms of what we've done with the animatronics has been the most limiting factor I mean, you know, we've got a lot of stuff there, and I know maybe we're not even animating at all when it comes to the software because we've got so much stuff going on. But what do you Um, think is, like, the most limiting factor moving forward? What would you like to learn next, I guess, is really the question. um, I I think I want to just learn how to create better support systems for, say, the heads and the necks and the shoulders uh, in, in the design process. Uh, because by looking at the motors, not having ever worked with them before, you know, a year ago, um, you suddenly realize what the limitations are and what the strains are on something physical. Uh, there's always going to be wear and tear in anything you do or anything you put buy, anything you get, you are going to create a wear and tear on it. And the trick is how to minimize the amount of damage that can be done on something before it would have to be either replaced or rebuilt. Uh, you don't want to have to rebuild something. You'd rather replace a part, but you also want to get that part as long of a lifetime as you can give it. So now that I've sat down and gone, well, let's take Jack Skellington, for example. I, 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 I built the basic framework. We had two servo motors in it uh, just to operate the mouth and the neck. Down the track, it'd be nice to add a whole lot more. Obviously, for now, we're limiting ourselves with just two. But the support frame is is a big thing. You don't want the neck to tilt so far to one side that the motor crunch and breaks. Uh, so you've got to figure a way to support that movement without it going too far where it does some damage to your motors and and put you on a setback situation. Well, and mind you, at that point, we're talking about we're still using 3D printed plastic. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you really... At this phase, the way we're doing it, it, it truly is anybody could do it. It's accessible. I mean, if you had a 3D printer and you're using the kind of servo motors, we're not using mm-hmm. theme park grade motors at the moment. We're yeah. And we're yeah. keeping this to a level that really, and I hope some people start to try this more because, and maybe we'll start making some of the files, maybe some of the older files accessible down the road or something. We'll talk mm-hmm. about that yeah. offline. But yeah, yeah. what I think is kind of cool, though, is you talk about like the Jack Skellington. We didn't really even know how we were going to animate him when we first yeah. built him. We were like, oh, yeah, make his neck turn and yeah. make his mouth. Yeah. And then you're like, well, if you want to make his mouth open and his neck turn at the same time, now you're you're doubling up sort of the amount of stress that's going into it. And it is a yeah. plastic frame and it still can be. But let's add the secondary support. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. You know, and then that goes back, like you said, then you go back to the drawing board because why are you going to sit there and try to edit a file? You're just going to yeah. go back and start over. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I'll say uh, as as we bring this episode to a close is it was so we so we're in the pandemic. You and I are start to independently tinker over here and over there and i'm talking to nick about linear motors and actuators and we start to put this motion platform together and we had a spring off of a hobby horse that you would find in a playground and we just had all these little like things that we were tinkering with it was very scattered it was not any one idea um and i think at one point we put the tvs up and we had like walls and you had started building the wooden track and i saw uh i thought about doing like something jurassic park or i don't know whatever but then I went, I went to Disney World. Uh, plane tickets were like seventy five bucks, and yes, it was a pandemic. I put on two masks and I went, and it was a ghost town. But I rode Mickey's Runaway Railway, and I think for me that was what inspired the through line. And, and also, I had been watching a lot of YouTube videos and learned about the Muppet Land promotion because I had not known about it, despite loving the Muppets as much as I do. And anyway, so it all it all coalesced when I rode that ride because. That is one of the greatest rides ever. It is is a very projection heavy ride, but it's so well done. It's the first time that Mickey's um, had his own ride, but it it um it became apparent to me that oh my god, the Muppets. If we do this kind of through line where the Muppets take over, it can kind of be a train ride a la Runaway Railway, and it can kind of just be that wild sort of runaway experience. And then when it gives us an excuse to do things like Indiana Jones. It gives us an excuse to bring in some of our favorite things. Like what a lot of people probably didn't see in the video is like, we've got a Star Destroyer flying over in the Space Mountain Galaxy um, because that we finally put in our little Star Wars nod because it's still Disney. So that's sort of the Muppets for you, right? The Muppets, the, the, the point of parody. And that that's why we went with that theme, I think. But, um, you know, once we nailed that down, once we said, okay, this is the story we're going to tell, then it became, who are the characters? Yeah, yeah. I think at a certain point, it was like, oh, we need a second animal. And you're like, oh, I can make an animal. I can just, at that yeah. point, we do, oh, I can make another animal. I'm like, oh, wow. Even like six weeks ago, that wasn't like a thing. You yeah, know? Yeah. So, uh, so we got to the point of knowing what, what the story was going to be. And truthfully, that was after the first video went viral on TikTok. Yeah. The first video went viral with a bunch of, and I'm saying this for the first time now, with a bunch of stuff I had in my camera roll. I did not put together a five steps, how to make a Disney five steps video uh, on purpose. I had a bunch of stuff in my camera roll, and I was like, I had this TikTok page with all my footage from my trip to Disney World. And I was like, I kind of just for fun put this video together, and I thought maybe I'll share it. And then it blew up, and I was like, well, now I got to share this ride experience what is this ride experience what what blew me away on the whole tiktok thing was the amount of people that had set up their own you know had set up a disney-esque page of links that would feed through and show what we were doing let alone the you know several other people doing their own little things and other projects too well, Which I mean, cool. look, Disneyland's closed. So yeah. if you're if you're on this coast, you know, you're you're kind of stuck without it. It was a while before they opened in Florida. All the parks worldwide were affected, I think, at some point or another. So, yeah, there's a it really does start with a, a, a yearning to go to a place. I mean, and you were never, by the way, and correct me if I'm wrong, until Galaxy's Edge opened, you weren't even like a big Disney parks person, were you? I never went that often. I mean, I, I went 20 years when I uh, go when I first came out here and it was like, this is incredible. I mean, it, it is mind blowing. But most no, most parks, theme parks for me, I'll go in and I will be entertained by the prospect of it. But it's not necessarily something I can go back and immediately go back and do the following week or whatever. Um, uh, Galaxy's, Ed did, uh, Galaxy's Edge did change it for me because I am such a huge fan of Star Wars that... It was incredible to see, but I was also more inspired to do what we were talking about because of it, uh, to to take take that challenge and see what can we do out of the normal uh, ourselves and 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 just learn the process of how to make it work and how to do it. And, and for you, Nick, is there like a 
I know you the other day you brought up to me something that actually is akin to a universal experience, but is there a Disney ride? And that, by the way, was uh, we were talking about the Twister ride, which is more of an experience you stepped into back then. But mm. was there a Disney ride that you went to the growing up that like that kind of connected with you? That is kind of that 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 sort of bug, if you will. I mean, they're all so cool. Uh, and Disney in general, uh, it seems like when you're there, just everything is perfect. Everything from just the sidewalks to the waiting in line in the queue and till you, you know, walking up to get into the ride car or train, whatever the, you know, whatever you're about to go do. Uh, to me, that's the thing. And, and it's kind of like what you said, like you look around and awe and you want to know how they do that. That was always a thing to me as from being a little kid and growing up and being to where I'm at now. And it's kind of the same thing with lighting and, and my production, like, or, or interest. When I go to a concert, I'm busy staring at what's in the lighting rig and the sound system and the speakers and the placement while I'm enjoying the show. I want to know how everything works. And, and that was always the thing. Um, yeah, I, that's just, again, and while I'm riding a ride, in the back of my mind, I'm trying to reverse engineer it again and then figure out just what's going on, why, how, and could, could I could I do this? And now I know, yeah, I can figure this out. It's I can make it happen. Uh, you'll appreciate this because I know you, you, you are familiar with Test Track. Uh, when I was in Disney World in, in this past August, I was trying to get a picture of the serial number on one of the sensors on the floor of the track. <laughs> And it was in the loading zone right before the ride vehicle pulled up for me to get on. And I couldn't focus my phone quick enough because I just wanted to know what brand sensor it was so I could, like, look it up later. Because that's where I'm at when I go to the park. Like, mm -hmm. I am looking up like you're talking about. I'm like, what brand projector is that? Mm -hmm. I'm, di I'm digging my fingernail into the actual tabletop to figure out what kind of paint they're using and what kind of covering they're using. To see you almost it. got us kicked out of the cantina. Yeah. I no. did not. No. no. <laughs> I, you know what? It's so funny, though, because we're sitting there and Brent is like, we're in the cantina and Brent is like, thumbing it he goes it's like mdf covered in some sort of resin or something and I, he's like i'm like you're peeling it off like i don't want to get kicked out of disney <laughs> we're gonna have to bring a forensics kit next time we go. <laughs> but i'll also also like it's i'll play it off as covid but oh this is covid protection no, 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 really <laughs> i was also I'll, I'll just pick up my phone and like hold it over the booth where dj rex is and then look at whatever photos i captured you know, like take take them blindly, and then be like, "Oh my God, look!" Just at all to the see cables. how he works underneath. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I mean, and and that's so that's how we get to thinking we have the ability or the I guess having the gall to build a dark ride. So thank you for listening to episode one. We will be back uh, next week with episode two, and we will talk about actually how we built this thing, how we designed it, and how we built it, and that's really where we'll go from here because. You know, it's one thing to get the car moving around the track. It's another thing to get things in sync and talking to each other and continually talking to each other and continually talk and, and, you know, points of failure and all that kind of fun stuff. So if you're a real geek, stick with us because you're going to love it. We're going to talk servos and animatronics and more DMX lighting. And so stay tuned. This has been making Muppet Land. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Brent. Uh, not just for this but for for your help on building it and it's it's been a lot of fun and brent really i i have to give you extra special props because without you it would just be a lot of zeros and ones and if you don't understand what that means i'll tell you on the next episode so <laughs> thanks for listening guys <laughs>